got to be close. We got to be tight. Find somebody right where you are. Look around. Make eye contact, but not with your family. Not with your family, not with your best friend. Look around and wave at somebody and say, I'm, I'm looking at you, you, I'm looking at you. Now, now hit your chest or, or give yourself a hug. Say, we're together. Tell them, say, we're together. And we got to stay together. We got to stay together. Jesus prayed in St. John 17. He says, Father, make them one that the world may believe. Now, I'm not going to suggest that this is some easy, uh, nicely wrapped up picture. No. This is challenging. It's very challenging. This is difficult. It's so difficult that Jesus prayed for it. He prayed for it. This is challenging even in our posture as Christians. When you hear about another denomination, you hear about another denomination. When you hear about another race, let's let's call it what it is. I'm, I'm not here this morning to make this this picture that everything is sweet and everything is wonderful. It's not. It's not. There's a hope. But what we look at is not. But I don't stay there like Asaph in Psalm 73. And he, he began to talk about what he was feeling in society. He said, it got so bad as I looked at things that it gave me a headache. He said, until I went into the sanctuary of God. And then I got revelation. I saw things through God's perspective. Now, I want to challenge you in that. I want to push you right now. Pam's going to come. In a little bit with a prophetic word directly from God. But I want to challenge you to get out of your comfort zone where you don't have to think about unity, especially now in the pandemic where there has been quarantine. I don't have to think about being one. I don't, I don't have to think about other denominations and the division that may exist even in the body of Christ. I don't have to think about that. I want to push you and say, you need to think about that. You need to think about it. You need to think about the hope. You must think about the oneness. What can happen when we're unified? How God can do supernatural things through the church, we represent him. And so I want to read this passage of scripture to you with the time that we have left. I want to challenge you with Jesus talking on the mount. This is Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9. Everybody say that. Say Matthew Chapter 5, verse 9. I want to read this out of the Amplified Version. And may it be what I read to you today, may it be posture for you. May it be the comfortable part of your heart and your life that you sit on. Everything I read today, I want you to push to get comfortable with it. How many of you have a favorite chair? You got a favorite chair in the house? No? You'll just sit anywhere? Okay. Well, I have a favorite chair in the house. You know what I'm saying? And by reason of use, the chair is sunk in a bit. You know, it's, it, it can show that I've been sitting there for a while. It's comfortable for me. It's comfortable. I sit there all the time. It's my go-to. And there are times when I get up that I got to fluff the cushions 
because they've gone down a little bit too much and it's got too much of an imprint of me, if you know what I'm saying there. Charles Spurgeon said this, and I shared this with our group on Wednesday. He said, he said, read and enjoy books. Enjoy books. Enjoy visiting good books. But he says, live in the scriptures. Live where God is. Enjoy that posture. Get comfortable. And so this passage that I'm reading to you out of St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5 and verse 9, this is what he says in the Amplified Version. Blessed, enjoying enviable happiness. Wow. Spiritually prosperous with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation regardless of the outward condition, are the makers and maintainers of peace. For they shall be called the sons of God. I want to read that again because it talks about who we all are. He says, bless, and here's the description of blessed for this group. Enjoying enviable happiness, spiritually prosperous, with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation, regardless of their outward conditions. Blessed are the makers and maintainers of peace, for they shall be called the children of God. Are you a peacemaker? Are you a maker and maintainer of peace? See, this is who we are. Even before we get to the world and society on any level, it must be like that with each other. I want to be at peace with you. I want to make peace and I want to maintain peace with you. I want to make peace and I want to maintain peace with you. Where does it start? First at home. First at home. How many of you live with other Christians? Put your hand up high. Don't be embarrassed. Be a maker and maintainer of peace at home with your fellow believers. Before Pam is my wife, she is my sister. I'm always seeing her as God's daughter. So how do I do that? How do we maintain that? We take communion together at home. And as a leader of this local fellowship and my staff, it's important for us to make sure there is opportunity for us to have communion together. But before we get to that point, I push you to take communion at home. Why? It, it helps me to be tender towards Pam at home. It forces me to remember that Jesus died for my son Jordan. That Jordan's sins were washed just like my sins were washed. As it goes towards my extended family, my son Andrew, my daughter-in-law Amanda, my son Ryan, my daughter-in-law Emily, we must make sure that we are makers and maintainers of God's peace first at home. Why is it so difficult for us to maintain peace with other Christians? Because we don't practice at home. Practice at home. Communion helps me to keep talking, and it helps me to stay tender. Everybody say that with me. Say talking and tender. That's what communion helps us to do. And so at home and then into the broader community, be a maker and be a maintainer of peace. It is a, an identifier. It helps you to identify yourself and for others to identify you 
as the children of God. Are you the children of God? Put your hand up. Again, put your hand up. We got movement today. I'm not going to let you get comfortable in the lawn chair on a beautiful Sunday morning in the park. I'm a maintainer and I'm a maker of God's peace. Now, before we get to society, and it's important for us to get to society, but we want to be tight first. Tight first. This is the practical side. Now, listen to this passage of scripture. This is one of my favorite passages as it relates to unity it starts off at home, 1 Peter 3. Peter is talking to this church. He's talking to this group, and what he starts off in the first verse, verses 1 to 6, six verses, he talks to wives. And he says, this is how you ought to honor and respect your husband. And if you follow this example, it'll keep you wives from being caught up with anxiety and manipulation and having to use witchcraft on your husband. Wow, that was a heavy one, wasn't it? Yeah. Witchcraft. Now, this isn't a marriage session, but I just want to let you wives know you don't have to go that road. God's got a plan that by your honoring response to your husband, he will turn it around. If you're married and you're a woman, say, Father, thank you for turning it around. Now, six verses are designed and dedicated to a woman. One verse, verse 7, is dedicated to a man. It's real simple. It says, husbands, treat your wives. Live with them in an understanding way. Understand her. Understand how she's wired. And for those of you that want to get married, this is what it costs. Understand the makeup. Understand the wiring. And just like you need unconditional respect, she needs unconditional love. She must be viewed as valuable and precious. Now here's the thing. I know some women would think, well, wow, why does God spend six verses on me and my responsibility and my husband only gets one verse? Well, there's some weightiness to it. He says, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way so your prayers won't go unanswered. You see the weight, the weight on that, how heavy that is? That means husbands, and I'm talking to believer husbands. There's value for all men and all husbands, but right now and what we're trying to get across, those husbands who are believers, make sure you honor, love, value, learn your wife, and then be understanding when you do it. Treat her as valuable and precious so that your prayers, that's a heavy consequence. So don't worry about the number of verses, ladies. The one verse that men get is concentrated. And I'm taking my time with this because so much disunity exists at the home, and it starts with husbands and wives. And as believers, I'm pushing you. Make your election sure at home, husbands and wives. Make it sure. All of creation is counting on us. So as believers, let's get out of your comfort zone, and let's pick up our cross. There's a song I heard when I was a little boy. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone. There's a cross for me. What's the description of the cross? Consecration. I am consecrated and dedicated to God as a wife, as a husband. Marriages, wave at me if you got that. You got it? Those of you that are at home, wave, wave if you got it. 
Nobody needs to be there to see you. And so that's verses 1 through 7. This is for everyone else in the body of Christ. Pay attention because this is the practical way that we start living in unity. Pay attention. Look at somebody near you. Say, pay attention. Wake up. Pay attention. Listen to what he says. He says, finally, I talked to you about the, the wife. I talked to you about the husband. This is what Peter is saying. Finally, this is for everybody else. All of you should be of one and the same mind, united in spirit. Listen to this color. Sympathizing with one another. Loving each other. As brothers and sisters of one household. This is the picture. Courteous, compassionate, tender-hearted, and humble. Never return evil for evil or insult for insult. Scolding, tongue lashing, berating, but on the contrary. Blessing, pray for their welfare, pray for their happiness, pray for their protection, and truly pitying and loving them. For know this, you have been called to this, that you may yourselves inherit a blessing from God, that you may obtain a blessing as heirs, bringing welfare and happiness and protection. I feel like I need to read it again, but I'm going to push you. Go home and read that. Listen to the next part of what he says. For let him who wants to enjoy life and see good days, good whether apparent or not, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from guile, treachery, and deceit. Let him turn away from wickedness and shun it. And let him do right. Let him search for peace, harmony, and undisturbed from fears, agitating passions, and moral conflicts. And let him seek peace eagerly. Don't merely desire peaceful relations with God. And don't merely desire peaceful relations with your fellow men. But pursue it. Go after it. I'll close with this. And as you can tell, this is a push. I love the blessing song that the worship team and Pastor Ernest sung over you. I love it. But at some point, we've got to realize that we are blessed to be a blessing. We are blessed to bless others. And so don't allow anything, anything to come in between your brother or your sister in Christ. Nothing. Now, that's not the only piece, but that's the first start of peace. And we want peace for our world, our nation. We want it for our region. We want it for our city, even our neighborhoods. We'll even march and protest for it. But may I tell you that the peace... The kinds of peace that passes all understanding. When things don't make sense to you. Peace that comes from God. It can only start in his church. Which means that if we don't get it right, y'all, it's going to be a minute before our society gets it right. And I don't want to raise, I don't want God to raise up somebody else in my time. That's willing to say, yes, Lord, I'll pursue peace. Beyond my words, 
and just be on a, an attitude. I am running after the body of Christ. Those of you seniors, may your seasoning of years, may your time on this planet, may you give it all over to the Lord. Every experience, every thought, every historical picture you have as God's holy sons and daughters, give it over to the Holy Spirit and lead with wisdom, lead with vision. Those of you, those of you that are in the young adult status, even mature teenagers, may I push you to link up not with just a social cause, and they are important, but will you run after and pursue the cause for Christ? I push you for this. Those of you that are middle-aged and unmarried and married, men and women, will you pursue God beyond the energy of just having a good life, a big house, nice cars, having children, getting ahead and moving up the ladder. Will you bring in Jacob's ladder? Whereas he told Nathaniel, you think I can do miracles? Wait until you see angels coming and going on the Son of Man. That's the cross. We have a responsibility, and we are the kingdom of God. So let's push for the only way he said it would work. Let's find our brothers and our sisters. Link up two or three. Gather together in his name, and he'll show up. He'll show up in your gymnasiums. He'll show up in your schools, your hospitals, your office buildings. He'll show up in government. He'll show up in your neighborhood. He'll show up if we show up. Many are called. Many are elected. But few are chosen. Who are the chosen ones? The ones that showed up. Right now, I'm on a mission. I'm trying to get every pastor I know, and I'm not ashamed of it. Every leader I know Pastors inside the church building and pastors in government. Pastors inside the church building and pastors in education. Pastors inside the church building and pastors in, in uh, prison reform. I'm trying to get every leader, every apostle, every prophet, every evangelist, every teacher in the church circle, but also in society to latch on to this especially at this hour because the unity of the church of Jesus Christ right now all eyes are on them Jesus says in St. John chapter 17 Father make them one make them one make them one that the world may believe make them one Make them one in us. Make them one like you and I are one. That a miracle might take place so the world can believe. Could it be, could it be that the miraculous signs and wonders that Jesus said would happen are not happening because the church is not together? Could it be could it be that eyes being open, the dead being raised, the lame walking, could it be that supernatural healing outside and inside is not taking place because the church is not, is not connected? I want to read this thing to you, and then I'm going to ask Pam to come up. 
This is one of my favorite passages. I started praying this prayer for myself when I was in my early 20s. I started praying this prayer for me because in my mind, it was all about me and my relationship with God. I want you to listen to now how I pray. And I pray this for the body of Christ. Locally in my neighborhood, in my family, our congregation, our city, state, region, nation, and the world. This is how I pray. This is the prayer I got from the Apostle Paul. He says, for this reason, seeing the greatness of his plan by which you are built together in Christ, I bow my knees before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom every family in heaven and in earth is named. That Father of whom and from whom all fatherhood takes its title and derives its name. May he grant you out of the rich treasury of his glory to be strengthened and reinforced with might, his mighty power in your inner man by the Holy Spirit of God himself indwelling in your innermost being and in your personality. May Christ through faith actually dwell and settle down, abide, and make his permanent home in your hearts. May you be rooted deep in love, founded, security, securely in love, that you may have the power and may you be strong to apprehend and grasp with all the saints. God's devoted people, the experience of that love. And what is the breadth? What is the length? What is the height? And what is the depth of it? That you may really come, come to knowledge and practically through experience for yourself, know the love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience, that you may be filled through all of your being with all of the fullness of God, may have the richest measure of the divine presence of God and may become a body fully and wholly filled and flooded with God himself. I pray that for me. And so when I got to the end of it, I'd be looking for a new car or a new house, better relationship with my girlfriend Pam at the time. I prayed. I'm telling you exactly where I was. And I was there for some time. All I wanted to do was be built up myself in God and with God alone. But then it changed. It changed when I understood that he wanted us linked up together. And so when I got to the end, and it said, Now unto him, who by in consequence of his actions and his power that is at work within us, he is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly far over and far above what we dare, what we ask, or what we think, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, our desires, our thoughts, our hopes, and our dreams. Before I leave and I read the last verse of this prayer, I want to let you know that if you, sons and daughters of God, brothers and sisters of God, mothers and fathers in the kingdom of God. If we can come together and not compete, not be suspicious, not be critical, not be divided, but if you find out, even if they go to another church, 
even if they're part of another denomination, even if their skin color is different, and God, God forbid, even if they have a different political party, if we can come together. Be unified in that love. If we can come together and hear the Father's love for all people, God's goodness for all people, healing and deliverance for all people, that everyone is significant. If we can come together, we could advance the kingdom and it'll go beyond anything you could have asked or imagined. You see, when it comes to healing, that's just starting the church. When it comes to generosity and meeting needs, shouldn't start with government. I'll start with the church. And when it comes to fixing racial issues, <laughs> I don't have to wait for a policy to be passed. I'm starting with loving those in the body whose color of skin is different than mine. Different than mine. And not just, oh, you know, I got a white friend. Oh, you know, I got a Puerto Rican friend. Oh, you know, I got a black friend. No. I don't want to stop until I see God's supernatural power flow flow racially and flow generationally, which means that God's not just going to work with me as a fine 57-year-old young man. That was for you, baby. That was for you. That was for you, baby. That was for you. That was for none of y'all ladies. That was for her. But as a 57-year-old man, I can partner I can partner with the 18-year-old young man. And the power of God can flow through both of us. Which means I'm willing to give up my platform. <laughs> you understand that? I'm willing to give up my platform and give up my leadership. And give it away. And this is the reason why. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 31. Verse 21. It says, now we do all of that to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. My favorite part of that verse is that everything we're doing it for, hear it now, hear it, it's got nothing to do with Christ Community Church of Philadelphia. Zero. The glory of it it's for God. Christ's community church is just, that's just a, a place where we gather together. We gather together. We have a name so that in our nation, the guidelines of having an organization, we can be identified. Oh, but I want you to know that our church name is not better than another church name. Are you guys getting that? Am I the only one that's jumping in the inside? Because I said, our church is not better than another church. Why? Because we are only one church. We are united. We are one. Our election is sure. And I'm ready to walk in my governmental authority. Ha <laughs> ha. I am part of the church of Jesus Christ. Is there anybody who serves with me? Is there anybody who serves with me? Y'all gonna have to do a whole lot better than that. Is there anybody who serves with Jesus? Are you a representative? Come on, I just, I guess I gotta tell you to stand up. I gotta tell you to stand up. Stand to your feet. And let's declare, He is Lord and we are one. Come on, say it again. He is Lord, and we are one. He is Lord, and we 
are one. Look at somebody. Stay standing. Stay standing. We're closing. Look at somebody. Put your arms around yourself. Say, this is for you. This is for you. Come on, find somebody. Say, this is for you now. This is, this is for you. So uh, I'm told to talk loud. They said, talk too soft. Do I talk too soft? Is this too soft? Yeah, that's the truth, but I wasn't going to say that. We're unified. So um, Pastor Taylor was sharing, sometimes I, I don't know if some of you do this, and when I wake up in the morning, before I do anything, well, you know, I'll brush my teeth, all that kind of stuff, but I'll check my email. I'll check text messages. And God let me know that what I have to say to you is always going to be more important and more aligning for you for your day, for your life, than any text that anybody has to send you. Look at that later. So I started using the Bible, like I said, I started using the Bible app. And you know the scripture that comes up when you use your Bible app? There's always one there for the day. And I said, well, that's going to be my, the first text that I read. If I have to look at something, that's going to be my first text. So this morning, I was, I'm probably not alone. I was feeling, just, I was feeling heavy. I was healing, feeling heavy about the political climate in that half of the country is thinking that the other half of the country is crazy. I was feeling heavy that there are things going on in family and with friends where they're just dealing with loss and with pain. We have extended family in other countries. I don't know if you realize it, but there are countries that are on severe lockdown again right now where their families, their friends, their loved ones, thousands are sick and dying around them. And I just, I, these things start where, uh, and other things were just going over my head, and I just felt heavy. And God said, open my text message. Like, okay, so I opened my test me text message. And if you guys have the Bible app, you saw this morning too. But I had an ASAP moment where I had kind of lost sight for just a minute of who God is and that his plans never change. He is always going to be who he is. And it, the, the scripture is from Mark, I mean, it's from Matthew 28. It's after Jesus has been crucified, resurrected. He's been with the disciples for those days, and he's getting ready to leave. He's getting ready to leave. He's telling them the most important thing that he has to tell them because he's getting ready to leave, and he's not coming back. He's coming back, but not yet. But he was leaving them, and this is what he told them. I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I've given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. I got a holy realignment this morning. I got a kingdom realignment this morning. Like Pastor Terry was saying, the president changes every four to eight years. What Jesus said here hasn't changed in over 2,000 years. And it's not going to change until he comes back. God's bottom line is he wants people. He wants reconciliation of every single person on the planet back to him. That's what we've been put here for. Yes, he wants to bless us. Yes, he wants to take care of us. But what Jesus said, he said, take the power that I have, that I put on you, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them. That's our goal. People are our goal. Don't get it twisted. Don't get distracted by the four to eight years. And believe me, I know these problems are real, and they're serious, and they're heavy on us. And we need to be in society doing things and taking care of the wrongs that need to be righted. But we need to be in society taking care of the wrong that was created when the enemy stole what he stole. And all of his power has now been taken away. It has been taken away and it's given to us. Take that power and go get people. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them and wait for the day that Jesus comes back to get everybody who has said, Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is my Lord. That's where we are. Will you accept that today? Will you take that power and go into all nations, baptizing and teaching, and know He is with you always until He comes back 
again. And even then, we're with him for eternity. Are you ready? You ready to go make those disciples? That's your priority. That is your kingdom realignment this morning. Amen? So, so hear this now. We're not in the building right now. We're going to be ramping up to November the 29th. We're doing everything, everything by the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to make the building on 40th and Chestnut safe. It's all with you in mind because we need to gather. I'm not trying to get all of Philadelphia into 40th and Chestnut. I'm trying to get and have been trying to get everyone who gathers at 40th and Chestnut all over the city, all over the city. But we get together to get built up. Look how good God has been for these months. We've had this wonderful facility. This is the biggest facility, I think, in the city. God's given it to us. He's given it to us. But as it gets cold, as it did last week, we can't hang out here all the time because I, I want you safe. I want you physically taken care of. So we're trying to get the building and have been working. We've got some amazing people getting the building safe. The 29th, we're pushing. And that's not to bring shame and condemnation if you're still working through being comfortable, okay? Please don't let the enemy come in with accusation, fear, <laughs> complaining, none of that, none of that. Just know that when you ask God, give the Holy Spirit something to work with. That's why I'm sharing with you. Safe, clean, sanitized, distanced, all of that is taking place. And we'll use every room we have. If we open everything up, we can get 1,300 people in there normally. And so we have a lot of room for distance. If we use the mezzanine and the balcony and the sanctuary and the lower level, we're working it. But we're not working it so that we can say we're back. No, we're working it so we can gather. Because some of you need, you need that touch. And I love the internet and I love the technology. But many of you need to see each other, which is why so many of you are out here this morning. So pray for Pam and I, Pastor Ernest, and for the rest of our leadership team and, and those who we're working with to make our building safe for you. But don't in any way, in any way, let that spirit, that spirit of suspicion, that spirit of fear, that spirit of condemnation, that spirit of criticism, don't let it jump on you. Don't let it jump on you. Your brother and your sister are trying to do better and trying to be better. Let me have your attention for this last thing. Before that, I'll tell you, if you do want to come, you're going to need to register. You need to register. Um, we want to make sure everybody's safe, so register. You're going to need to register. But this is the last thing that I'll say to you. Pam and I are going away this week. We're going to be in Alabama. We're going to be hanging out with uh, Ed Savoso and some leaders from around the world bringing transformation. The beauty of the Transform Our World ministry is that we are giving ministry away. We're giving it away. We're giving it away to the two or three. The two or three. This week, Wednesday night, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, we're going to be having a conference broadcast. So everyone can take advantage of seeing and gain more insight and more strength. Please, I am pleading with you. 
I am pleading with you, make the necessary adjustment to your schedule, if you can, to see it, to hear it, and to own what we've been teaching you. Own it. All of Philadelphia is at stake. All of our city is at stake. All of Pennsylvania is at stake because all of heaven wants to transform all of the earth. And he's using us to do it. You guys receive that? You receive it? Put your hand up high. Put your hand up high. Let's close it down just a little bit. I want to talk directly to your heart right now. Make a decision. And this is for you reaffirming. And this is for those of you who may be passing us by or on the fringe and you're hearing this. I want you to know God the Father sent Jesus Christ to die for our sins. Don't forget the message of the gospel. It is one that is established in love. God loves you. And so, hold your hand high and reaffirm. And if you guys are saying this for the first time, even those of you that may be watching, reaffirm this. And if you're saying it for the first time, mean it with your heart. Say, I believe, even still, that Jesus died for me. He was buried for me. He was raised up from the dead for me. And right now, Jesus, you're my Lord. Jesus, you are still my Lord. I declare that every opinion you have is my opinion. I am fully aligned with you in heart, in will, in purpose, and in action. I live for Jesus. Use me to change the world for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's celebrate God. Come on, y'all. Celebrate God. Celebrate God. Celebrate God. God bless you guys. Have an amazing rest of your week. Go and change the world.